Wow, praise God. Thank you, Neha, for a passionate declaration of the goodness of God. And a very practical application. Let's, let's just calm our minds for a moment. I might just get us just to stand just for a moment as we will pray. And, um, yeah. Father, we, we just calm our minds and our spirit before you and we invite Holy Spirit to do in us something of revelation something of anticipation, something that will bring transformation in our life. And while we talk about some practical things, we also pray, Lord God, that you would lead us into the heavenly realm in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a bit of a stretch and then take a seat and praise God. Well, I'm going to start with my teacher's hat this morning and then we'll get on to some preaching. Uh, the reason is, um, Acts is a wonderful book. Who, who loves Acts? Yeah. Who's, who's read it? Who's read it more than once? <laughs> Acts is one of those books I think we, we can live in. And of course, we are continuing to write the Acts of the Holy Spirit and the Acts of Prayer. Uh, hopefully we're um, an Acts 29 church. I remember going to a conference once, I think it was up in Katooma, you know, the Katooma conference, and the speaker got up and said, I want everybody to go and read Acts 29. And everybody came back the next day going, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, we're it. We're it. Praise God. Over the last month, I've um, attended some memorial services along with some others here, Memorial service is where you remember somebody who's passed away. Acts begins with a different sort of memorial service. The one who's passed away has come back. And for 40 days, he's presenting himself in his resurrected form, teaching, commanding, and encouraging his apostles to not look back, but to look forward. And um, as, as we come into the book of Acts, we just need to bear that in mind, that this is Jesus at work. Luke, the writer of Acts, also wrote the Gospel of Luke, um, referred to his former book when he first starts. And um, he said that in that book he laid out Jesus' words, works, life, death and resurrection. And now he continues that account. So Jesus appears right at the beginning of Acts. But if you look at the end of Luke, it's exactly the same, or pretty much, very similar. That Jesus is there at the end of Luke, he's there at the beginning of Acts before he ascends. And we'll talk about that next week. Um, so Acts picks up where the Gospels finish. It talks about in, the, uh, in Jerusalem, the church began in Jerusalem and then it grew rapidly. There were periods of intense persecution and with persecution people moved out and as they moved out, they talked about this Jesus community. They talked about the resurrected Jesus. They gave testimony of what God had done in their lives. Congratulations, Artie. Praise God. Oh, look at that smile. I love that smile. Uh, wow. Where was I? Persecution. <laughs> so as the persecution came, people would relocate. They'd talk about Jesus. And as they talked about Jesus, um, people would say, we want this too, and they'd form a church or form a little gathering, or get together and have communion, um, or have a communion meal, not just, um, you know, some bread and uh, juice. And um, Acts records that. 
and it records how the church expands from Jerusalem to the outermost parts of the world as they knew it then, basically the Roman Empire. But also Acts talks about growing pains in the church because it was initially very much a Jewish movement. It was in Jerusalem. The apostles were all Jewish and the Holy Spirit came and touched their lives and um, they had questions like, well, what makes us a Christian? Do you have to become a Jew to become a Christian? Um, And how do we deal with the Gentiles? How do we deal with the Romans? How do we deal with people from all over the world? And so... Acts shows how the church went from a basically Jewish-based belief into a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural fellowship. Just like us. Praise God. Well, I hope we are. And the end of the book, uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, we find not one of the original apostles, but an apostle chosen by Jesus, Paul. Um, It was Saul at the time. Saul was his Aramaic name. Paul was his um, uh, Greek name. But he's being transported to Rome to face the emperor in order to show that Christianity is not a threat, but it's a blessing. Christianity is not a threat to any culture. It is a blessing. And the world that we're in is wanting to pull down everything that Christianity has built over centuries. But let us also remember, we are a blessing to the community. In Revelation 7, 9 we read, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Now that word nation is ethnos, so it does not necessarily nation as in national boundaries, but it is groups of people, people who will identify as, as a particular group. But everybody is here, and we're standing before the throne of the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches. Well, you, you need to read Revelation 7 in its context, but there is the picture of the time when restoration is imminent, the earth is going to be restored, renewed, and uh, population is going to be renewed. And who's there? Every tribe, nation, people, and language. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to share some observations uh, from the first 12 verses. Uh, Today, I'll just be looking at the first five. But before I do that, I just want to give us... I guess some hints on how to read Acts. Because isn't it an exciting book? Doesn't a lot of stuff happen? And it seems to go bang, 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 bang. And we go, our church is not like that. How come we're not like that? Are we missing something? So I think we just need to sort of step back a bit and um, understand how Acts works. So the first thing about Acts is it's a... Compressed history. All, all histories are actually compressed. Um, if you read a history of World War II, the author will take this battle and that battle and that battle and compress them down into 500 pages or whatever. Acts has compressed about 30 to 35 years of history down into 28 chapters. And like all writers, Luke has picked the highlights that he wants to show, and I'll talk about his purposes later on, but that he's showing what God has done. And so if we were to take every, absolutely every event that happened to every apostle and believer at that time, um, as it says in John 21, you know, you you couldn't fill, you'd fill the world with, with books and you still wouldn't be enough. So Luke has compressed down and he's looked at basically Peter and Paul and a few others. So when we read Acts, we we need to be careful to understand um, Luke hasn't put in a calendar. In fact, 
ancient calendars weren't very good anyway. They, they weren't very useful. Modern histories would say in 1936 or in 1932 uh, on the 1st of September or whatever. Um, but Luke didn't do that. But he did include some indications of elapsed time. So, for example, Acts 27, 27. Uh, when the 14th night, okay, so 14, oh yeah, okay, two weeks. Acts 28, 11, after three months. But sometimes he didn't put anything. Um, the period between Acts 9, where Saul is converted, and Acts 11, where Barnabas goes to Tarsus to find him, was about 14 years. So you just have to think, okay, uh, Luke has put all these together, but not everything is happening straight after the other. Some things are happening more frequently, other things are happening less frequently. So when we read Acts, we just need to bear that in mind. It's a, a type of history. In fact, it's called ancient historiography, which means basically ancient history writing. All the Gospels are ancient history writing. It's, it's, um, Luke uses a Greek form. If you read a Roman history, history, it's about how great the general was and how he conquered and how he did this and how he did that and what a wonderful person. If you read the Gospels and you read Acts, it picks up all, all the bad things as well. It's a, it's a real record of, of the good, the bad, the ugly, and how wonderful God is that he's taken us and brought us into his presence. And it um, describes that journey from Jerusalem to Rome. We can't judge Acts using modern historical methodology. If you want to understand Acts, you need to understand ancient historiography. Um, that's something else, and we won't go into that. He uses dynamic storytelling. Who loves a good story? Oh, come on. We all watch movies, we all read books, we all listen to one another. Of course, we, we love stories. Stories are a way of communicating truth or a lie. Now, unfortunately, in our society, story has generally become... Uh, understood as fictional. But not all stories are fictional. Your story is not fiction. When you tell your story of how Jesus touched your life, it's, that's not fiction. And so Luke uses storytelling, the same as Jesus used story storytelling, um, but he um, used a, a few things that we can actually consider as we go through. First is a little technique called prefiguring. So we, we learn about Barnabas in Acts chapter 4, but then Barnabas, we um, go into uh, Acts 11 and we find that he's central, becomes central to Paul's growth and development and, um, and, and establishing um, Paul's ministry. Um, Luke used personal narration. In, in Acts, there are a number of um, passages that are called we passages. That's where suddenly it goes from they to we, to us. And um, I've, I've made a little handout of just some of this information that you can pick up from the um, uh, table outside. I'm going to try and find out if we can just make it available online. So you, you don't have to badly take notes. But... Just being aware that Luke is giving a first-hand witness account. He was there. He's validating. And then also there are a number of progress reports. Some of these progress reports are basically saying things are going really well. The church was growing, people are growing in depth, and there are six um, progress reports indicating five waves of movement away from Jerusalem um, to uh, the rest of the world. Then we come to speeches. In ancient writing, speeches were as important as a battle. A speech could change the nation. In fact, speeches still do, don't they? World War II, um, UK was at its end and Winston Churchill began to speak and people went, yeah, 
we can do this. Uh, that's just an example. Well, Luke includes 32 speeches. That's 25% of the whole book. So speeches are important. And some of those, those speeches change lives. The other thing about uh, Acts is there are a whole bunch of court appearances. Right from the very first few chapters where the apostles were brought in front of the Sanhedrin. Remember um, Acts 4 after um, uh, they, they heal the man at the beautiful gate. And it goes right through to Paul waiting to see the emperor in his final court appearance. Most of the speeches, um, not all of them, but most of the speeches are found in uh, the court setting. Um, and the longest speech recorded in Acts is Stephen's speech before they um, are basically execute him. Okay, Luke had some purposes. I'm not going to elaborate on them too much, but I'll just move that. Just go through them quickly. Um, he wanted to record the development of the early church. He wanted to show the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. And some call Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And as Gary mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, when he spoke, it's the Acts of Prayer. Uh, he wants to show that Christianity is not a threat to the uh, Roman world. He wanted to record the influence of Christianity from Jerusalem to Rome. And that's not a negative influence, that's a, an influence that actually transforms people's lives because the way Christians lived was so different from the way the Romans lived and from the way the Greeks lived and from the way the barbarians lived. It was just so different. Uh, to document various uh, uh, misunderstandings and persecution, like do you, you have to be circumcised to become a Christian? That's um, um, one of those um, misunderstandings. To show that Jesus is the head of the church. So these are just some of Luke's purposes in, in writing Acts. Um, in, in, in Acts there are 11 main themes. Uh, first of all, the Great Commission, which we're going to talk about over today and next week. The priority of, eva of evangelism. The power of the Holy Spirit, community life, teaching, prayer, breaking human barriers... So it's no longer just Jews, it's Jews and Greeks and barbarians and, and women. Women. Oh, we can include women. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the place of suffering. Because many times the disciples suffered, either through persecution or through other things. Paul suffered in shipwrecks and all sorts of stuff as well. Um, the sovereignty of God at the end of the day. The Jewish reaction to the gospel. Uh, the legal status of Christianity. Because if Christianity was part of Judaism, then it had lots of legal things that it was able to do, like you didn't have to worship the emperor. But if it was considered that Christianity was different from Judaism, then you would have to worship the emperor. And, of course, that's where a lot of persecution came because Christians would say we cannot worship the emperor because Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the Son of God. And they were titles in that society that were only set aside for the emperor. <clears throat> um, Acts 1 introduces 12 uh, themes. I'm not going to go through that, but I think we'll just pick them up as we go along. But I just wanted to give you that very quick overview, just, I guess, as a way of equipping yourself as, as we go to read Acts. So we don't just read Acts as a novel, but as we read it, we begin to pick up the purpose, we pick, pick up what God is doing, and we begin to apply it in our own lives. All right, let's um, read Luke's word. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll turn this off. We've come to the end of the slide, so you can relax. I'm not going to assail you any further with that. Take my teacher's hat off. It's really hard to do, actually. <clears throat> In my former book, Theophilus, 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, uh, the gift my my father promised, uh, which you've heard uh, me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days, a few days, like 10 days, okay, um, you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit. That's just a little example of some of the terminology Luke uses for time frames. Um, <clears throat> then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the whole focus of this passage, and I'm I'm mainly focusing on the first five, but we are commissioned to be witnesses. Um, Last week Mandy uh, shared, based on Matthew 28, the, the Great Commission. And we're all familiar. I think that's probably the most popular Great Commission uh, passage, but every um, gospel has a Great Commission passage and then Acts picks it up and reiterates it and expands it. And the basis of, of, of the Acts is the Holy Spirit. Baptism will empower us to be witnesses. So Acts is that clear continuation from Luke's Gospel, as I picked up earlier on. Just as a personal exercise, why don't you read through Luke and Acts? Just start at Luke 1 and finish off at at Acts 28. Just do that, just read it like a novel and see what God will do. Um, You know, because they're basically one book. Um, When I say one book... In, in, in those days, they had scrolls, and on a scroll, you had a word limit, right? Um, you know, if you put in an assignment, say a 500 word, 500 word assignment, probably a, an A4 double page, closely spaced, 10 point, whatever, okay? Um, so, he only had enough words for the gospel to put on scroll number one, so he wrote scroll number two which was a continuation. So you had Luke and then the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, And and it's that historical movement from the Gospel to the Church alive, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 45-49, it reads, Then he, that's Jesus, opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, this is what he's written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Well, that's already happened, right? Because he's there with them. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So there's a framework of what's to be preached. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send to you what... My Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And so there's a picture there of the Holy Spirit coming and clothing us. If you can imagine, you know, um, there is that sense of baptism where as you are immersed, you become clothed in the, in, in, in the liquid of a, you know, you know, water baptism. Well, here we're being clothed with the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. Acts 1.8, we should all know that uh, off by heart, that when the uh, Holy Spirit comes, we, he will empower us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, put that in brackets, because after Solomon, Judea, and what was then Samaria or Israel broke apart, 
but under the gospel they were joined together, the whole of Israel from um, the north to the south was put again, um, and to the outermost parts of the earth. And Acts 1-8 basically sets the framework or the structure of the whole book. So the first part of the book set in Jerusalem, then it's set in Samaria, and then you have Paul going from Antioch and his missionary trips, and then his trip to Rome. Uh, so Acts 1 8 gives us that sort of um, a, a, a picture. And it says, We are to be witnesses. Uh, th- that's the Greek, same Greek word that we use, that we tra- transliterate as martyr. Uh, we're to be witnesses of the good news, the gospel. I'm going to go into that in a lot more depth next week. But Jesus is speaking with authority, and I just want to come back to the question of the authority of Scripture. In 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21, uh, Peter states that their testimony is based on their personal witness of the events of Jesus' life. Then he goes on in verses 20 and 21 to state, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in in the human will. But prophets, through uh, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter is picking up a theme in Acts because there were prophets that were recorded in Acts and of course there was the prophetic message spoken in Acts right from the very beginning. Amazing. The word of Scripture. Powerful. Now moved by the Holy Spirit. And Acts, um, in, in, in Acts, Luke clearly states his account is a continuation of that former book. So there's an authority between Luke and Acts. We hold to the truth of Scripture. Luke records what God led him to record. And we need to grab hold of that. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Are you excited? Someone was saying to me this morning, I'm so excited, I just love Acts. So excited about what's... God's going to do. And that's our theme for this year, is equipping for ministry. Because every single one of us is called to minister. And every single one of us needs to be empowered and to set free. And we'll all have different ministries. I'm, I'm, I'm not the passionate, loud, jumping up and down preacher. I'd probably break the stage if I did. But some people are. We're all different. But as we manage and work our way through Scripture, it does something in our lives. The second thing that um, Luke talks about here in Acts is the reality of the resurrection. In um, Acts 1 verse 3 it says, after his suffering, after his death and burial, He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs. And I understand from that word that it's the sort of proof that you would give in in, um, uh, a court of law or something like that to show that this is true. Many convincing proofs that he was alive. Well, I think the very fact that he suddenly appeared in the room and said, oh, can I have some fish? That's pretty cool. Um... Who are you, Lord? I mean, here we are, walking along, um, speaking, amazing stuff. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. 40. That, that's that journeying um, from one place to another, from the old to the new, um, to, to the place where um, they were meant to be. And 40 days he spoke about the kingdom of God. 
Jesus is that king. Where the king is, there is a kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7, Paul writes, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared, listen to this, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 at once. And some people say, oh, yeah, you know, there's a psychological state. Come on. Out of 500 people, there'd be a, a good percentage of people with their minds engaged and saying, this is real. This is real. 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. So when Paul was writing this, he could go to eyewitness accounts and say, have you seen Jesus? Yeah. I've seen the resurrected Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Did he speak to you? Yeah. What did he say? Right? And I'm sure Luke did the same as he was doing his research to write out the book of Acts. Because don't forget, Luke wasn't a Jew. Well, most people believe he was a Gentile, a physician, a Greek, uh, it's a Greek name. And how, how did he get interested in this? We don't know. Maybe he just bumped into Paul one day and Paul said, hey, have you heard about Jesus? And Luke says, no, but I want to hear more. Wow. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Now, I'm, I'm only including the... Uh, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus in that 40-day period. Because Paul then goes on to say, then he appeared to me um, last of all, but that was after Jesus had, had, had ascended. So in that span of 40 days, Jesus appeared to a wide range of people and groups who could give first-hand testimony. And so this is not uh, a spurious claim. Uh, the atheists will say... Oh, you know, well, even, even Christians and the Jews, they would say, if you're dead, you're dead. We know there's a resurrection coming at the end, but um, a mid-history resurrection, that's not in our books, but here is this Jesus, and Jesus is here, and he's, he's proven the reality of who he is. The next thing Luke records is the command to wait and be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts 1, verses 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And that reinforces Luke 24, 49, where he says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city till you have been clothed with power on high. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are some church traditions that don't. It's there in scripture, but they say, well, it doesn't seem right that you know, you have to wait for a, for a second sort of a thing to happen to become a, a Christian. Well, that's not what it's about. Baptism is not about salvation. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about salvation. One definition states, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a definite experience subsequent to salvation where the Holy Spirit comes upon believers to anoint and empower them for spiritual service and holy living. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about salvation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for those who are saved to empower us to do the mission that God has. Now, can we do the mission that God has given us without? Yes, because he's filled us with the Holy Spirit at that point of salvation. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that we can experience, not just once, but maybe many times in our lives, at different times in different places. Uh, I've never been able to find it, but um, uh, someone said of um, Charles 
Spurgeon. But somebody came to him and said, why do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And he says, because we leak. <laughs> but that's one of the things about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, well, I'm just going to go through a few things. The baptiz- baptism of the Holy Spirit should, shouldn't be conser- confused with salvation, new birth or sanctification. The Holy Spirit is involved in all of those things, but baptism of the Holy Spirit is not those things. But it's available to all uh, so that we can have provision of power to witness, to know his will, to do battle in the spirit realm. And where we leak, overflow like streams of living water. Yeah? Um, As a gift to those in need and to be... Um, enabled to operate in his gifts and ministries. Now, we can, we can do things just out of talent and training, and we need those. But the Holy Spirit just puts an edge on that. The Holy Spirit should never be seen as a replacement for the fruit of the Spirit either. If we are born-again believers, or born from above believers, probably more correct, The fruit of the Spirit shall be showing in our lives. Let love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That should be the basis. Now, I didn't show much of that this morning, did I? I got a bit grumpy this morning. Um, But, you know, that should be our general demeanour. The fruit of the Spirit should be operating in our lives, regardless of whether we're baptised in the Holy Spirit or not. Make sense? I oh, know husbands and wives are going to say, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, all right. The Holy Spirit clothes us with power, enables us to be witnesses, uh, which we'll explore next week. The power to discern the will of God. For example, Peter had a very strange dream. He saw a sheet come down with all sorts of stuff and a voice saying, you can eat all of that. And he's going, Whoa! scorpions, Lord, cockroach, it. Whoa! Are there lizards? Hmm. I don't know how many times that, that I felt I needed to call somebody. I call them as just the right time. And many of you have had similar experiences where you feel you need to do something or you need to go somewhere. Or you even need to read something. The Holy Spirit doing something. Power for, uh, for spiritual warfare. The Holy Spirit enables us to discern and to stand. The power for overflow. So as we minister the love of Jesus Christ to people's lives, the Holy Spirit is just somehow touching their lives. Um, we, We become like channels, as it were, so we just need to be continually filled with his Spirit. It's not whether we can hold the Spirit of God in our lives, but that as we're baptised, that the gifts and the ministries of the Holy Spirit touch other people's lives. And as we impact and relate with them, that the Holy Spirit is imparted into their lives as well. The power for ability. Demonstrate through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to go into all of those, but um, there's a whole lot of them. Um, Jesus' command in Acts 1, 4b and 5 was, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, my Father promised. Wait for the gift. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. I've just given just a little glimpse into the, uh, into the beginning of Acts. Into the beginning of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Andrew. Into the time where Holy Spirit and fire impact our lives. I want to encourage you to make uh, Acts a part of your Bible reading. Even over the next 
year or so, however long it takes for this to go through Acts. Maybe just sit down and read it all the way through. If you've, if you've got an audio version, just listen to it. And other times read it slowly and meditate on it. And do it. But listen and hear. Acts is full of beautiful narrative descriptions of the sounds and the smells and whatever. Join Paul in the middle of a storm, in the middle of, of the ocean where they're being buffeted and Paul has a vision of um, an angel of the God whose I am, who brings comfort and that um, he knows, he just knows that everything's going to be okay. They're going to lose everything, but they're going to be okay. And that he could then stand in front of them and say, hey guys, we need to have something to eat. I know, as I know, God is going to save us. Allow Jesus to communicate with you through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Anybody here have dreams? I mean, like you wake up and there's, yeah, one person, oh, how many of us are human? <laughs> we all have dreams, don't we? Most of the time we have a dream, we get up and we go, what was I dreaming? Last Tuesday I woke up and I had a dream and I can still remember it as clear. In the dream I was a competent bowler in a cricket match. <laughs> that could only happen in a dream. Suddenly I found myself on the veranda to the right of the cricket pitch. And the cricket pitch was about 300 metres away. It's going that direction. And I haven't finished bowling my over and there I am. And I don't have a cricket ball. So I'm trying to bowl anything I can grab hold of, but there's a wind and the wind is just blowing against everything and stuff's just falling on the ground. So I went off and to search for a cricket ball and I couldn't find one. Then I woke up. And maybe that's how you feel. Maybe, and I'm just going to ask us to stand at this point, maybe you've had encounters with God in the past and you've been active in the things of the ministry. Maybe there's some stuff that, and it's like you've lost it. It's like you've lost the cricket ball and you've been set aside and taken far away from the field that God has given you. Now, I believe that as we journey through the book of Acts, God's going to restore some of those tools and some of those gifts and some of those ministries. And God's going to take hold of us and maybe for the first time in our lives and maybe again, he's going to lift us up and he's going to put the tools in our hands and the spirit in our life and the words in our mouth and the ability to do the things he's called us to do. This is just the first of, I don't know how many segments of Acts we're going to look at. But it's not about Acts, it's about the Holy Spirit. Acts is just our insight into what God has done and what God can still do. But this morning there's a call to receive the Holy Spirit to empower us to be his witnesses. And I think pretty well every, every part of Acts there's a call of God to allow the Holy Spirit to do something in our lives. I just want to maybe just to close our eyes and just to quieten our spirits and just invite Holy Spirit to presence himself once again. Let's just invite Holy Spirit to 
the song we used to sing, that we are standing on holy ground. And I know that angels are all around. And I'm getting that mixed up with another song where it's saying, Holy Spirit, let your presence fall. We've got time in this place. Holy Spirit, let your presence fall. We give you permission. to begin to do the work in our lives. Maybe sometimes we've rejected you. Forgive us. Maybe we've got too busy. But Lord, we just stop even at this point. Let your presence fall. Let us no experience your presence right now. Holy Spirit. Okay, I love you. 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 I Praise be to the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is here. This is a, an invitation to the move of the Holy Spirit as the people connected with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts and the church was journeying. It was being formed and growing and journeying together in a practical way. And this is the invitation that is being made to us. Today is the beginning of that journey together as we journey through the book of Acts. We will not exhaust you with too much teaching. We want an experience of the Holy Spirit together. We want an experience of that growth and maturity in the practical work of the church as we minister outside. So prepare yourself, prepare your heart. Go into prayer and fasting as an individual. We did that already corporately, but now is an invitation for individual connection to the move of the Spirit as experienced in the book of Acts. So prepare yourselves, because time and time again we'll be inviting people to come for prayer laying on of hands for baptism in the Holy Spirit. We'll be laying hands on people for prayer for healing as we journey through this series. And so that you know, we'll be doing this series two by two and we give free preach in, in between, but at least two week series, sometimes we may go three weeks. Depends what the situation is like. But let's tighten our belts and let's go. Not just feeding the mind here. We want an experience of it in the spirit together. But if you are here and you have not known the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, because as the Spirit was moving and the church was journeying and growing. It was growing because more and more people were being added to the church. So you could be here and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior. We are not in a hurry. We are here to pray with you 
so that we journey together. Is there anyone like that here? Everyone saved? Praise be to God. In the process, we'll, we'll, we'll entertain rededications as well. And those who need baptism in the Holy uh, um, water baptism as well will be taking names down. And that will determine how soon we have our next water baptism service. So get ready and let's be on the journey together. Now as we leave, thank you very much, Pastor Dale, for that powerful introduction and invitation to this journey on the Book of Acts. Praise God. And thanks to Neha for challenging us and getting us to repeat after you. Some of it was longer than we could remember, but we tried. Praise be to God. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Praise God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And the church says, Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, praise and worship team, for ushering us into the presence of God. We want to connect with what God is doing week after week and keep coming and let's keep fellowshipping together.